What a beautiful ball. Now it's Cristiano Ronaldo with a chance maybe to seal it. And he has taken it. Love in all kinds of space. Love. Muller through Muller. Could be embarrassing. It's three. Tony Cross. Olivier Giroud. Park is found Klein with a speedy burst. And that's terrific from Vardy. Oh, what a goal by Jamie Vardy. Hello and welcome to the Football Hipsters Podcast Euros. This is another new voice of hosting. Um, I don't know if this is getting contagious, but Chris Chris was our host and, and, and now has skipped off two days. John then took the reins of hosting and, and now he's disappeared as well. Um, you may not hear from me ever again, but we'll have to see how it goes. It's Ross's um, plan for FHP domination. <laughs> it's certainly uh, Ross is taking over. But as, as, as we mentioned, Ross, I will say I'm joined with Ross. And of course, you've already heard him. I'm John Madrew as well. How are we doing, guys? Go ahead, Drew, because I'm I've, I've I've got to be perfectly still. <laughs> wow. So yeah, no, yeah, we're good. Ross is having some interesting yes. new issues this yeah. evening, so we apologize in advance. But we're all here, so yes. thanks Ross for joining is us. sitting in the most statuesque <laughs> position possible. Mm. But uh, we'll go straight into the games. Um, so I, I wonder, there's only one place we can start, really, and that's with the Portugal-Hungary game. Um, it wasn't a game I billed to be a high scoring. I said it was going to be a nil-nil, and I don't think I could have been any more wrong. Drew, you said it was going to be 2-2, so I'm going to let you take the reins with this and, and, and go for gold with it, mate. I was close. Well, I mean, everyone knows Hungary were topping the group coming into the last day. Portugal needed to win or at least to get a result to have any chance of going through. So, you know, you'd expect that they, they would come out fit and firing, looking for goals. And I think that suited Hungary's style of play. I mean, we've seen from them that they, they can control possession and pass when they need to, but their bread and butter has been the counter. And I think that's why there was goals in it. And, and you know, back against the wall, Ronaldo had to turn up, and, and he did. He had a brilliant performance. Him and Nani uh, had the goals. Ronaldo won a brace. Nani got the got the got their first. So, um, and Balash Uzek had had two nice goals from outside the area as well. So, um, but no, I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised at the scoreline. Um, I didn't think it was three three, but as you said, I, I predicted two two. But and you know, I think that's just indicative and reflective of what both teams needed on the day. And and once it get to the last what minute. Of, of the match, both teams literally were happy to just pass the ball around and, and, and get the, both the point that they, they both needed. And it's a brilliant result for a hungry topping group that no one gave them any chances to even get out of. Everyone pre-tournament said that they would finish bottom and just enjoy the experience. But, you know, uh, uh, Bernd Stork come in and, and he said that he wants to try to make every major tournament from now on with Hungary and this is a good building block for them. Um, so we'll see how it goes from there on out. But a uh, good showing from both teams. And uh, Ronaldo in scoring form going into the knockout stages, if he keeps that form, mm. um, given the side of the, the the table that they're on, which we'll come on to later, that could be pretty quite dangerous. So we'll see how that goes. Certainly will. Ross, I mean, Hungary, we certainly underrated them in our preview show. I think I was guilty of saying they're the worst team in, 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 the, in the competition and they've gone on to top the group. But a special man who, who I know that you went off in our, in our group chat about was Zoltan Gira scoring. I mean, <laughs> how good has he been for Hungary today and, and throughout the tournament? How surprised are you at Hungary overall? Uh, Gira has been uh, an absolute metronome. For, for Hungary, and I think they'd be significantly weaker without him. The, the impressive thing is that he's 37 years old now, and I remember watching him in the Premier League and didn't think he was all that, but he certainly still had something about him. But at 37, I would have expected that to have been long gone by now, so it's great to see um, great to see Gira doing so well with Hungary. He's got a fantastic goal today. Um, as, for the, as for the entire Hungary team, I think they're proving once again, as so many other teams are, that they're, they're, they're better than the sum of their parts. They're um, so, so good on the ball. Very good defensively. They haven't got the best strikers in the world, but they seem to just dig out goals somewhere. I know two of them were absolute wonder goals today. But um, yeah, I mean, thoroughly impressed with Hungary. Completely deserve their place in the next round. And again, I said, I said in the preview pod that I wouldn't put it past um, any team in this, in this competition to, to bring a surprise and possibly go on and win it. And Hungary are right up there as one of my picks for, for surprise winners of this tournament now. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't complain about that. Um, I guess all we have to talk about really is that they'll be playing Drew. Yes. They won't be playing Hungary Drew. They'll playing... be silly. <laughs> Just no, not... uh, they, they play Belgium, who we'll talk about later on. But that'll be yes. an interesting tie, um, considering the, the results we've seen. So, yeah. Certainly will, certainly will. Um, so, the other game in the group, obviously was the team I was looking after, which I've enjoyed so much throughout these three matches. Uh, Austria played Iceland, uh, lost 2-1, unfortunately. Um, 
it was it was a mad game in in a, in a way that not not as mad as a three three Portugal Hungary, but uh, Iceland started off brilliantly. Um, they they hit the bar with it from kick off basically within thirty seconds and really had Austria on the rails. I don't know the the name of the guy who had the shot. I believe it was Gunnarsson, but when I'm older, I only plan on having one son and not having to remember eleven <laughs> sons' names. No <laughs> long how long I've been waiting to do that joke. I'm sure I do actually. <laughs> Um, but no, um, and, and it came to the point where Iceland really were carving out chances, but Austria were also going to be the dominant side. But in the 18th minute, Bodvarsson, um, who came in for Finn Bogerson, who didn't, who didn't make the lineup uh, in the game, and uh, scored a goal. Uh, it, was, it was reasonably well worked. Came from a throw that was actually a foul throw. The foot of the player was over the line, shouldn't have counted, but no one really coaches those things these days. And it, and it got flicked to to, to Bod- Bod Varsen and uh, and he flicked in and uh, Austria clearly shot the fans went dead silent there was an eerily eerie silence throughout the stadium and it was it was a while before Austria got back in the game it wasn't until the 60th minute Shop who's I know Drew you've been a big advocate of, of of him and think he should start I believe he's at Schalke am I right yes yes Shop, yeah, yep. Schalke. Mm-hmm. he joined from Nuremberg I believe in in January but uh, he's, uh, he's he's certainly been exciting when he's coming and. and I've been really impressed and surprised he didn't start the game considering how Alaba played in the second match. And he was brilliantly laid off by Alaba and, and, and ran through uh, the Iceland defence to finish brilliantly. And then after that point, it was literally defence versus attack. Austria bar- blasting forwards, trying to get balls in the box. Janko came on. I now to get a couple of chances. But uh, ultimately, it didn't. I should mention, because I've meant, I forgot to mention, is that before that, Austria did miss a penalty. Uh, Dragovic stepped up and hit the post in the first half. Awful. I don't know what's <laughs> going on with teams trying to get their centre backs to take penalties. We've seen it with Ramos yesterday, missed the penalty, and Dragovic today. And Ross is very happy he didn't put him back in his fantasy football side. Yeah, but I'm also <laughs> quite annoyed that I took Alaba out in favour of Kroos, and then he gets a bloody assist. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, uh, Ross, you're doomed to be the battle of the FHP table. Hey, right? hey, hey, give us time. <laughs> We're just warming up. <laughs> we will come on to fantasy football later. But, uh, but yeah, no, but then. All it took was Alma to be up there for another pitch for a corner. Uh, nothing really came of it. Ran back to his goal. At that point, there is literally no <laughs> Austrian defence whatsoever. Iceland pick up the ball, run up the other, the other end of the pitch. And uh, it, the ball comes across to Traustassen, and, and he finishes really well for a guy that came on only for the last few minutes to play and very composed and a great finish. And that sealed second place for Iceland behind Hungary on joint points. And that means they'll play England, I'm right in saying, yes. uh, on Monday night, which is probably much better. I think the England fans will be much better having Iceland over Portugal. Although, Ross, I will get your thoughts quickly because you thought that it might not have been the tie that we might have wanted. Yeah, I, I would have much preferred Portugal myself. Um, the reason being simply because um, so far in this tournament we've seen that England have a real problem with breaking down teams that defend in banks of four, and Iceland are going to be a team that are going to defend in banks of four. They're going to be perfectly happy playing that way. They're going to be perfectly happy trying to get us on the counter and on set pieces. They're going to have to. They're going to ask us questions, and we're going to have to try and answer them. And I just don't think that right now Iceland are the team to be playing. I still think we'll win. Because of because of the quality difference and the fact that it is the knockout stage, they will have to come out a bit more. But I I am still far more concerned about Iceland than I would be about Portugal because that Portuguese defence is so open and and bad at the moment in this tournament. So for me, it would have been much more preferable to get Ice, uh, to get Portugal. But Iceland is is still is still okay. I still would have rather had them over Hungary personally. So it's not the mm. end of the world for me. But I, I still think it's much trickier than Portugal would be. Interesting. I don't think that's an opinion many people share, but it's one that I think is quite valid, actually, if you think about it, because you look at the likes of when England play against these defensive-minded sides. We've seen against Slovakia, we couldn't get the goal, and, and who knows what happens if against Iceland it ends up going to a penalty shootout, and we know how good we are at those. So, yeah, uh, I mean, that's, that's the thing. We haven't really played an open offensive team yet, and that's what Portugal are at the end of the day. They will try and outscore you, whereas the teams we've had in our group were trying to get one and hold it, and that's what Iceland are going to do. So I think for all the criticisms we've had so far... I think we should save them for when we play a Portugal or a France if we can get around Iceland and they can get around um, their their last 16 game just to see how we do against these bigger teams because at the moment I don't think we've seen enough evidence to say that this England team is bad at this or good at this so for me Portugal would have been much more preferable but yeah, yeah. that's just me yeah certainly uh, quick word I know it's hard Drew but a uh, quick word on Austria um, disappointing I mean, isn't that the quick word? The quick word is disappointing, but <laughs> <laughs> do we long it? No, it's true. You and I have talked about a lot before that we both rate Alaba quite highly, as much as everybody else that's involved in this sport rates Alaba quite highly. But it's 
And I know that you kind of have to go with uh, Christian Fuchs at, at left back, but surely if, if you don't play Alaba at center mid because you, you want maybe more defensive continuity from, you know, from uh, Baumgartlinger and from Ilsenka, then maybe you have to, but you can't drop Alaba altogether. So they're trying to fit him in, but that's not his best role. I mean, I know he got the assists, but for me, I think that Austria really struggled this tournament having a, a, enough quality in creating the types of chances they needed. You know, Schopf was probably the best one doing it. You know, he, he came on in the second match, and he was the brightest one, off, even just off the bench for his little cameo. And then today he came off the bench again and, and got a goal. And so you, you have to wonder, you know, it's are they placating to Alaba? You know, are, are they, they just don't know what they're doing, like, tactically? Like, they have a lot of questions to ask themselves. So moving forward, for a team that has more quality than, than people realize, it was just a poor tactical showing i think that i think that they just got it all wrong this tournament in regards to not quality i think they took the right players i think tactically they just didn't do nearly enough and the the, the, the players were playing all wrong for me i think i know you've agreed on some aspects of that but for me it's hugely disappointing i mean for me it's right up there with how how disappointing ukraine has been i think it's same boat yeah. am i right in thinking alibar has played a different position at all three games He's played defensive midfielder in the first game and because he was further up the field in the second one yeah. yeah, he played ten in both of the second Which and third games. He just shouldn't be doing it. Like, I don't know. Yeah, because Austria played non formation, so they play five yeah. at the back at the start. Yeah, that's the thing. If, if you're going to you put him in a different position, keep him there so we can learn it. You know, that yeah. seems simple right. to me, but still, I, I don't know the ins and outs of the Austria team. It might have been a case well, of he's, he's our best player. We have to play him somewhere, but mm. you know, it's, um, it's, it's a strange one. It's just consistency would have mm. been a lot better yeah, for yeah. him. Agreed. It was more the case of losing Yunizovic to injury in the first game, which meant that we had to play Alaba at 10. Otherwise, Alaba would have been in the place of Ilsanka. And to be honest, Ilsanka came in and had an excellent tournament, I felt, when he, when he was actually called upon. But uh, anyway, I digress. We'll, we'll move on now. Uh, Drew, you watched the, the Belgian game. Um, Sweden had a slight chance to, uh, to get through to the next round, but they didn't manage it, did they? No, well, I'm going to try to be nice here. Uh, I don't want to really break down Sweden and say it's 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 Lodzen and another ten, but the way they play is Lodzen and another ten. There's there's some quality in there, you know. Everyone knows how good the likes of Sebastian Larsson and Kim Shashamara on set piece deliveries. You know, Lindelof is coming through at Benfica to rave reviews. Um, Martin Olsen is is a quality left back that at least getting forward with his pace. And then you have uh, someone like Emil Forsberg, who is been at RB Leipzig, and he was one of the stars when Sweden won the other 21. So uh, they have the players, but tactically they're, they're so rigid in the 4-4-2, and they lack anything going forward in regards to, to, to any quality movement trying to break people down. And really, I mean, their best chances came from deliveries into the box. It wouldn't surprise you, considering they had Ibrahimovic and Marcus Berg up front, and that's what you want. They're both strong in the air, but... Like for the most part, Belgium dealt with it pretty handily. I think they have one or two chances where you know they had a decent showing and they created some chances. But after that, they they break down, you know. And then with Himovich trying to do everything because he feels like he has to, he doesn't. He still doesn't put enough faith in who's behind him. That's just not enough. Um, and I think you know when you go into a tournament, you can expect. You know, he's one of the best strikers of this you know modern generation. You have to say, but even when your supporting cast just doesn't turn up enough every match, even that won't get you through. You know, we saw today that, you know, Ronaldo had a brilliant game, but everyone turned up, you know, Gomez, Nani, and the like, they all played well, but Sweden, again, they just lacked things, and as for Belgium, I think they struggled a bit. You know, they did create some chances. Um, I thought uh, Kevin De Bruyne was brilliant yet again. Um, creativity, he was, he was super mobile, interchanging with Hazard and Kraska all match, and I think I thought that was brilliant, and um, he created quite a few chances, but the goal came from <laughs> Russia 9 goal of all people, but he scored an absolute belter from distance, and he does have that ability to do that, but I think Belgium again showed that their best chances, bar the goal they scored, came off the counter, where De Bruyne would pick the ball up, look up, and he would see Hazard running down the left, Lukaku made a run down the middle, and he would pick one of them out, and then they, they created the, the real penetrative uh, attacks via that instead of the build-up possession when they allowed Sweden to get back and defend. Sweden wasn't too, too troubled bar one or two chances. So for me, I think um, because Belgium are going to be on the, the easier side of the bracket, I still think they have a chance to actually go deep in the tournament despite the, the bad start against Italy. But for them, it's going to have to be, I think, Vilmos has to get his tactics spot on every match. And it won't be easy against Hungary. We've seen Hungary turn in some good performances on both sides of the ball every match they've played so far. So I don't think Belgium can just walk, expect to walk through just because you know it's Hungary and not somebody else. So I think they have to be at their best. But um, I still expect them to at least get to the quarterfinals. But we'll see. And, and as for Sweden, it's unfortunate that 
someone as good as Zlatan won't be putting on the Swedish jersey any longer. You know, he's yeah. retiring after the tournament. And same thing with the Isaacs, and this is also his last tournament. So they're losing two key, yeah. key people moving forward. So we'll see how they develop, and we'll see what Belgium does the rest of the tournament. Yep, certainly will. Uh, Ross, on Sweden, um, I wanted to ask you on something. Um, I remember previously you asked me about the role that Ronaldo plays in into Portugal. Um, I've made the point that if you took out I bring this up because someone tweeted about saying who would win Wales without Bale or Port or Portugal without Ronaldo. And I said that Portugal without Ronaldo would beat Wales with Bale because it would create a team and it wouldn't be focused around a single person in relation to Sweden. If you took out Ibrahimovic, I don't think the same sort of thing happens. Would you agree? Um, to a certain degree, who, who comes in to replace Ibrahimovic now that he's going? Who, who's uh, there? Gidetti. Gidetti. Gidetti, yeah. I, I'm a big fan of Guidetti. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too concerned about the, the, the firepower that you lose. I think it's the star power that you lose with Ibrahimovic, that ability to just do something out of the ordinary. And I don't know how many other players in that Sweden team have that. But you look at the Portugal team, there's plenty of other players that can do something out of the ordinary. I know Ronaldo is, is by far and away the, the, the biggest name in it, but Nani, he can do something out of the ordinary. This um, Renato Sanchez, he, he, I, the first time I've seen him at this tournament, he looks like another player that could pull something out of the bag. But I look at the Sweden team, I don't see the same star power behind Ibrahimovic. So, yes, I, I can see... I can see what you mean, but at the same time, if you take Ibrahimovic out of this and you put Guidetti in, I think once, like again, like Portugal, you will create a better team, one that isn't trying to think, well, how can we put Ibrahimovic into this move? How can we bring him into the game? It will just be, oh, Guidetti's open, let's pass to him, or Guidetti's being marked here, let's not pass to him, whereas it's not the same case with Ibrahimovic. So I, I can see both sides of the argument, but I certainly do think that, um, that Sweden without Ibrahimovic is, is a much weaker starting eleven. Mm, mm, certainly. Um, so as we say, Belgium will go on to play the winners of the group, Hungary. Uh, I think, I think out of the two, Hungary and Iceland, would Drew? Would you say Hungary be happier with Belgium, or would they rather have played England? If you think about it, who got the best draw? Do you think? Well, I, I think Belgium still have some concerns at uh, particularly left back. Um, I think the mm-hmm. way the way Hungary can counterattack down that side, especially we saw that today uh, against Portugal. I think they'll, they'll fancy them because Belgium are going to want to go out and win. You know, they have yeah. pressure on themselves to now that they have the easier side of the bracket to, to get through deep into the tournament. So they're going to go out and, with expectations. And Hungary now have no expectations at all. They shouldn't even be here, but based off of what people thought pre-tournament. So now it's just play with freedom. You know, enjoy enjoy the rest of the tournament. No pressure off. If even if this is where it ends for us, we did brilliantly to get here. So, and sometimes that's the most dangerous opponent you can come up with against in the, in the tournament. So you know, we'll see. But I think Hungary will like their chances as well. Mm, yeah. Okay, Ross. Um, mm. We watched a different game, um, and uh, it was Italy against Ireland, and a lot of changes we expected in the Italy side. Ireland needed a win to get that third position, depending on 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 what else went on. But uh, tell us what happened. Well. It's uh, it's as simple as Ireland won one nil. It's um, just the most incredible story. When when Chris at the start of this 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 podcast series said to me, "I want you to cover all four of the domestic teams," I thought, "Okay, that's going to be a bit of a struggle for the first for the first fixtures." But when we get to the knockouts, it'll be easy. Although it'll be England that I'll be covering, maybe Wales. To think that all four of them have gotten through. I mean, we we said in the preview pod that Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland would just be whipping boys that they got championship quality players perhaps even lower especially the northern islands case no one saw them going through at, it, at most you could possibly see one of them sneaking through but both of them is is just the most fantastic story um and you can't honestly say on the balance of play against italy tonight that they didn't deserve it because the republic of ireland were all over them italy gave them every reason to beat them every opportunity as well um ireland did fluff a couple of their chances should have had a penalty in my opinion from uh, from attacker in the first half wasn't given did kind of look like it was going to go against the Irish, but uh, Robbie Brady in the end with a, with a really nice header. Can't think of who put the ball on his head. I'd love to turn my head and find out, but if Houlihan. I do, Houlihan, uh, Houlihan. Say, if, I, if I do, my audio will go all over the place. So let's not try. It. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's it's fantastic to see Ireland come through. Such a incredible, incredible moment to see the goal go in and the celebrations after the game. I mean, Buffon the first one up to to congratulate the Irish um, yeah, staff that. as well it's, it's just the most fantastic story to see them come through so I mean this is the reason I love football for, for the stories like this mm. so 
Yeah, I mean, it was it was funny because Houlihan missed a chance right before the goal as well. He was clean through and, and then you think it's all over and, and then he whips the ball over for Brady to win it. It's, it's just amazing how things can change and Andy Townsend was uh, was going mad in, in, in the commentary. And I think, to be fair, I think Arlo were unlucky not to get a penalty in the first half as well. Um, well, I can't remember who was knocked down, but uh, uh, Bonucci certainly knocked him down. And uh, like, like it, was Aaron, um, it was McLean that got got elbowed in, in the back but I can't think of who it was I think you might have just said it was Benucci but Benucci, I think it might have been Benucci it was it, it, to me it looked very very um, very very um, strange that, that decision from, from the yes. Italian fullback but at the same time that's that's how the Italians defend they, they do just get involved and get yeah. stuck in but still yeah that, that was something I wanted to bring up with Drew um, there was a lot it, I know you didn't see the game but it was quite argy barges a lot of this shirt pulling in the box and, and, and pushing people over in the box and nothing being given. And it's that moment when you think, if that was outfield, there'd be a free kick given there. What's your whole stance on the whole, if, say, someone jumps up for a header and your shirt's being pulled and you go down, is that a penalty? Well, I mean, it has to be. I mean, I'm biased because I, I played striker all throughout my, my <laughs> days playing. So clearly I'm going to say that, you know, if, if I jump for a header and someone's tagging my shirt and it impedes me from challenging for the ball, of course it should be called. So... And how many times do we see that called, like you say, in midfield or in an area that's not as dangerous as the penalty area? But I think consistency with, with officiating is hugely important. I think if, if one call is one way in one part of the pitch, it's got to be the other way in the other part of the pitch. I, I don't think it should be based off of the level of, of danger of the location. You know what I mean? I, I just feel like players know that they'll get away with it at that point. And I think a precedent has to be set where this is the rule. Like I think if if, if you start finally awarding those penalties, players will then stop doing it. And then they don't have to, you know, they don't have to rely on that and they have to be smarter with marking instead of saying, you know, if I mismark my man, I can just tug on his shirt and I'll, I'll get back into position and the ref's not going to call it. You know, I mean, a lot of players do that for that reason. So I feel like as long as just the, the refs just have to be consistent, I don't think it's any, too much to ask. You want that in any other sport where it's officiating. I think this is, this is no different in that regard. Yeah, no, no, completely behind you back there. And uh, it was funny because in the Austria game, the, the penalty that Austria were given was for Alaba being pulled down in the box, not necessarily by his shirt, but he was having his arm held. And uh, and that's what got it. So, but to be honest, overall, I, 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 Ross, would you agree? The officiating overall, I think it's been pretty decent throughout mm. the tournament. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've said since day one that, that, that the officiating has been quite quite relaxed. You know, they're, they're letting a lot more go. They've been a lot more tolerant and a bit more... Uh, um, What's the word? Conscientious, lenient. I suppose. Yeah, lenient as well. It, the, the, common sense, that's what I'm really aiming to say. It, it does just yeah. seem there's a lot more common sense going on of, OK, we can get away with that. I understand how you've managed to pull him down there. I understand that that's just a tangle of the legs, that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm all in favour for the way the refereeing's been done. The other thing I would say on the refereeing of that game, though, is I think Ireland were quite unlucky to not get another penalty for an for a elbow on Shane Long. It was it was an elbow mm. that was thrown whilst a corner was being taken. Not not maliciously, but it was still thrown. And um, the, the referee's blown his whistle for, for pushing. But if, if that happens during normal play, you give a penalty for it. So for me, I'm not entirely sure why he wouldn't have given it, you know, mm. if, if he'd seen it, because it was still an elbow in the face. But um, that's Shane Long for you. Shane will just, will just annoy you and buzz around. <laughs> and he will get the crap kicked out of him. But it's, it's what he does. He, he just annoys players into throwing those kinds of elbows and holding him down. So it's um, just another night for Shane Long. And you're not biased in any sense of the word. Not a saying. single jot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to be fair, I did enjoy him scoring up to Sirigu. That was that was brilliant. The way yeah, he's, he's going, um, come on then, <laughs> fiery Irishman is Shane Long. Yes, so. typical, typical. Um, so Ireland's reward is a game against the host France. Drew any hope for the Irish? You know, honestly, I, and I know that the, the Chris and Lana, who you, who you guys will speak to after the French game, will agree that there's still questions over the French defence. So you, you never know. I, Ireland can catch you on the break. And then they, they will work hard. And I know that's, uh, as we always say, it's cliche to say, but I think they've proven that it's it's done them well in, in certain appearances. So they're going to have to defend the best match of their lives if they're going to try to shut down the French. I think that, that's, that's the question right there. If they can defend well, limit the amount of quality chances that the French will create in and around the area and then look to break, they, they might be able to, to sneak a, a surprise. Mm-hmm. But... France is at home. I put my money on France, but I don't think France is going to walk away. I think it might, the score might be a little closer than people are expecting. I would honestly yeah. say that if you swap Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland round in their ties, I'd mm-hmm. put my money on both the Irish teams to go through. But it, huh. the, the, the way it is now, I, I don't really like the look of Republic of Ireland because the Republic of Ireland have, have got good attacking quality, 
but the defence is the problem. Whereas yeah. Northern Ireland have great defensive um, solidarity and movement, like whereas it, it's the front that's, that's weaker. For some reason, they're not playing Will Griggs. So, so <laughs> perhaps it will change if they do play him. But I, I would back the Republic of Ireland to beat, to beat Wales and the Northern Ireland mm. to beat France. But the other way around, I, I'm, I'm cautious of both of them myself. Yeah, I mean, I tweeted out earlier, I think, saying that I thought Alaba had been the di- biggest disappointment of the competition so far. Thinking about it, it's definitely not seeing Will Green. <laughs> I cannot get around that fact after all the build-up. But uh, anyway, before we um, go into the rest of the fixtures that, have, that will round off the round of 16, I want to get your hipster's choice. And there's only one place we can go first, and that's Drew. No, so we're gonna go. With, we're gonna go for Ross first, just because I, I haven't given us any thought at all. So I kind of have to go last. So, Ross, you want to take the reins? <laughs> I will, because um, even when I was watching it, I thought, right, I don't care what happens in the late game. I know who I'm picking today. Um, mm-hmm. Won't surprise anyone to, to know that it comes from Hungary. Uh, my one goes to, if I can get the name right, Lovrencic because I thought he was fantastic at both ends of the field. He was putting in great balls for, for the strikers and uh, Salai, but he was also running halfway down the pitch just to stop uh, counter-attacks and stuff. He was he was so, so... Um, well, he was everywhere. He, he just worked so, so hard for them today. So, for me, it's uh, it, it's that guy whose name I'm not going to try and pronounce again. <laughs> okay. See, I can't pick you now, because I'm not going to be able to pronounce it. So. Lovrenshitch. 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 Okay. There you go. Well, Andrew... I was gonna, I it. was gonna say Zizek, but I I would actually go with Levencic because I think Ross was spot on. I th- even though Zizek got two of the goals and and Gary had that that stunning volley, but mm. Levencic was really the one that a lot a lot of the things Zizek got the ball a lot because of Levencic's work ethic a lot today. So I think I. I think Ross is spot on. I think I'll give it to him. So yeah. Anyone impress you in the Belgian game in particular? No, not particularly. I, honestly, yeah. I mean, uh, the, the Bruyne, the Bruyne, the Bruyne, <laughs> but I, I can't rave any more yeah. about what I already do. So there's no yeah. problem. <laughs> yeah. I think Ross is nailed down the hipster choice yeah. sort of thing. I will give a shout before we crown Lovrenchich with it with for Arneson of the Icelandic defence, who was an absolute rock uh, for them all day, clearing defence, clearing away balls, blocking shots off the line. He was absolutely fantastic. And uh, if I'd have watched. The other game, and if you guys have watched this game, that might have been a close competition. But obviously, I didn't see the other game, and I'm just the adjudicator, so Lovren Chich does get it. Okay, so um, we'll go through the round of 16 features other than we've already mentioned. So we've got Portugal, Hungary, Iceland, England, Belgium, Hungary, and Ireland against France, which we've mentioned. Um, Drew, Spain, Italy, thoughts? I'll let you take the reins for me. Oh. <laughs> No, go ahead. It's your team. You have to. I'll just get the, the, the quick two senses. It's not good. I don't know who's going to win. I think it, okay. it, it can go either way. There you go. Okay. In my opinion, of all the big teams, Italy was the one that I'm least worried about for Spain. Um, even after seeing their horrible defensive display against Croatia, uh, I think in around a 16 match, you'll see a much more focused Spain with a much more ideal uh, scenario of knowing that they need to just back it up and, and not concede stupid goals like they did against Perisic. But uh, the simple way of beating Italy is by the quick pass in play, and, and Spain are masters at that. If you see David Silva playing a ball like he did it through the Croatian defence against Italy, I think it'll work exactly the same. It's, it's, it's physics in a way for Spain. It's just how they know how to play. They beat them 4-0 in the European uh, finals in 2012. Some people might say they, they've they gone on since then and, and improved, but at the same time, you could say the same for Spain. So we'll have to see how it goes, uh, but I personally put money on Spain. Um, I'm going to give Wales, Northern Ireland to only one person. <laughs> Ross, what do you, what do you think? Uh, uh... I think it will be Wales, but the issue you have with this game is that um, Northern Ireland will love playing against Wales, that they will love the opportunity to go out there and play them. And you've also got to factor in that this is a, a domestic rivalry as well, and you can never, ever, ever control all the variables in, in big rivalry games. So it will be very, very tough. I still think Wales will sneak it. I don't think it will be by many, but it could be a very entertaining back-and-forth kind of game. OK. Uh, Germany-Slovakia, Drew. I actually have a concern or two. Uh, honestly, uh, <laughs> I mean Germany is always going to be a favorite, but I think it depends on what Jurgen Lowe does. If he starts Kimmich at right back, I'll have fewer concerns. If it's Hoedes, I'm going to have more concerns just because of he he lacks pace as a right back. And, and we've seen how Slovakia are so good on the counter, and they do have pace going forward and the ability to, to, for Hamšík to to pick a pass that he can. Germany could get count on a break, and you you pointed out yesterday, and, and you were right that if you know if if the likes of uh, you know, Northern Ireland can can get the chances against Germany that they had on the break. That you don't know if someone with the quality of Slovakia, they might be able to to get those chances and put them away. So, 
Germany has to take the, the matchup seriously. Um, they, they have to be very German, honestly, to, to get the result. I, I think they will, but again, I don't think it's going to be uh, a walker job. I think it's going to be maybe like a one kind of affair. We'll see. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, I don't know how much you're going to know about this, Ross, but uh, Switzerland, Poland, what thoughts? Uh, I don't know too much about the individual teams, no, but I have, I have seen them in the tournament. And mm. based on what I've seen, I would say Poland, but that depends entirely on whether or not they can get the ball in the back of the net. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not convinced on Switzerland myself. I haven't seen enough of them to believe that they've yeah. got more than more than enough for, for, for the round of 16. So for me, it's it's, it's Poland. But again, it, it all depends if if they if they can get their strikers going. Certainly, so. I mean, Drew. I think that we we after the first game, a lot of people were raving that the likes of Granite Xhaka, we know, because of an obvious link to our, to our team. But we've actually not been so impressed in the last latter games. No, I don't, I don't think so. I am. But... Switzerland, they've been really good in possession, and Xhaka is one of those main reasons. But uh, as some of the people I talk to on Twitter, uh, we, we discuss things like stats and whatnot. Xhaka's, most of Xhaka's passes haven't been forward. They've been either uh, to the side or, or backwards. And they're usually, when they are forward, they're only down the left-wing channel. So he's not been as creative as people have touted him to be. He controls the midfield very well, but when you come up against a Polish midfield that contains Krzysztof you're going to struggle. <laughs> um, on, and I know, oh you, and exactly, I know how much you <laughs> rave for him. And, and, and Poland, when you look at it, just when push comes to shove, they, the quality of their strikers is vastly superior to the Switzerland. So if if you get Lewandowski a half chance, he's going to score. Milik might need six chances to score, but I would back Milik, uh, Milik over someone like a Seferovic if he starts. And I, I think Poland's wide play is quite quite better. Um, I think just top to bottom, they're a better team. That said, if the Swiss can swing a surprise and play Mbola from the start and catch Poland on the break, they might do something. But I would back Poland. I said they could make the quarterfinals pre-tournament we talked about. I, I still think they'll do it. Um, but you never know. It's just, it, this Euro has proved that anything is possible. So, Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, I guess the last thing to talk about really is our fantasy league, obviously, it's been a while since Ross Covier is. Uh, it's been a while since uh, we've, we've gone through this, and uh, I'll update you to where we, us guys, are and who's at the top of the league in total. So, at the top on 174 points, I don't, I, I, he must be cheating, uh, <laughs> is Jabroni Ellsbury, and the team is the Jabronis. Still the greatest name of all time. <laughs> um, top of our lot is what I can see is Drew, you're sitting on, in eighth on 143 points. Take it. Uh, all friend of the pod, Ellis Mel, 14th, 130 points. Uh, I am look to be second on 123 points out of us guys. Then I'm going down. Oh, John and Chris are next to each other. Joint 29th place, both of them, 117 points. It's weird, isn't it, that you think it come out of that? Oh, I'm scrolling, and I'm scrolling. <laughs> I'm scrolling a bit more. Oh, 49th place. You've gone up, Ross. I know, I left the 50s again. Yeah, so... 98 joint not joint 49th with one two two others on oh, 98 points so things are looking upwards have, have, have you guys ever watched the f1 where they do the first round where they just wore up the tires that's us we're gonna get there <laughs> pass check a flag first you couldn't have named your squad better i mean no, blow I expectations is, is <laughs> um john's made me do this but i wasn't going to tell you guys about it but there is a thing called you can activate your wild card yes. for the knockout stage where you can change your whole team for free it doesn't cost you any points even though chris liked spending 16 points on four players for some reason and i think one of them was vardy so that went well because chris <laughs> has no experience in the fantasy matters he's got to learn <laughs> <laughs> i do remember when he put john terry in his, his first <laughs> And he got yes, sent off. That yes, was and and Courtois as well. Sent off. That that was brilliant. So any any chance to give a job at Chris there, but uh, <laughs> yes. But anyway, do change your teams around. Do what you like. Um, and uh, knock Jabroni off the top. <laughs> sorry, not I sorry. intend to. <laughs> <laughs> um, any last things to say? I, I think I should mention. Um, I know it's the Euros, but I wanted a, a point to the Copa America. Uh, Argentina beat uh, the USA. Sorry, Drew. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sad. <laughs> 4-0 in the semi-final and uh, at the time of recording the other semi-finals have been played between Colombia and Chile uh, Chile obviously looking to get a successive Copa America title and I'm not sure when the finals actually played I'm guessing it'll be at the weekend at some time Sunday, maybe? yeah Sunday uh, Sunday at 1 o'clock in the morning on, so that'd be Monday morning I guess uh, for that, so check that out uh, all I can say is the, the next game is on Saturday, which yes. will be yep, yeah. so Saturday we've got Switzerland, Poland Wales, Northern Ireland, Croatia, Portugal. So, uh, 
Yes, three matches, all back to two o'clock, five o'clock and eight o'clock. So uh, back to the normal schedule. So you've got football all day to watch. So all good. All's good. So only last thing to say is, is to thank my guests because I remember to do that. Um, thank you, Ross. And thank you, Drew. No, pleasure as ever. And uh, I'm going to get this right. Keep your pipe stoked and your satchel <laughs> clean. Uh, easy, easy, all day long. Uh, thank you for listening to TFHP euros and uh, we'll be back in a couple of days for the round of 16. It's a great effort!